Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'll call your attention to the announcements that are printed in the bulletin. Uh, the noisy offering today will benefit no, will benefit local food shelves, and the kids will be picking that up right after the baptism. We'll again invite the children up front to watch the baptism instead of the children's sermon. Uh, there won't be any confirmation class or Sunday school this coming week because it's MEA weekend. Uh, another reminder about the Lacquaparl Conference Welka gathering and the Keep Cozy Coat Drive. Big Ben Lutheran is getting ready to serve their meatball supper on November 2nd. Uh, equipping congregations has changed their schedule. They're in three different places. Instead of having everything in Wilmer, they're going to meet in three different spots and at three different times and days. So if you're interested in that, there's information on the bulletin board or on the uh, Synod website. And of course, you could tell, since we have people sitting in front, we have a baptism today. We'll be baptizing Charlotte Lane Polinski, daughter of Lindsay Moe and Riley Polinski. It hardly seems possible. <laughs> Golly, I'm getting old. Are there any other announcements that should be brought forth this morning? Other than that, I'm old. All right. Let us begin then. For the call to worship, we will read responsibly the 121st Psalm. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Our gathering hymn is number 514.
blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond all our days. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ. A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. The peace of Christ be with you all. As God has given us peace through Christ, so let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. Please stand as you're comfortable and greet those around you with signs of Christ's peace. seems to be sort of a hot topic. The first one is pretty simple. They ask, why do we kneel at communion? And it's not so much about the position of kneeling as it is the idea that when we change position, we understand that we're going to a little different place. That's why we stand and sit. That's why we kneel, not so much to show that, that we're in, in a position of supplication, but just to think to ourselves, it's a reminder, this is something different and special. The second question is a lot more complicated, and I know it wasn't written by a confirmand because I watched her mom write it, but, and she admitted it. It's a really good question. The question is, uh, why don't we have more time at the communion rail to pray or repent and confess before receiving communion. I don't know if you ever feel this way, but sometimes to me, feel, communion feels like a relay race. The ushers are counting the right number, they get up here, you get up here, and you're ready to kneel, but you don't want to kneel before everybody else, you've got to wait for me to say so, and then you kneel, and you get communion, and I don't always even wait until I'm done giving you communion before I go to the next person, right? So it's, Body of Christ given for you, body of Christ given for you, body of Christ given for you. And the person behind me sometimes gets so hot on my heels that you can't even get that chewy wafer off the roof of your mouth before you've got the wine in your hand. And then there's that really tricky part, when do we stand up and leave? We spend a lot of our time at the rail, I watch you all kind of looking at each other like, the last thing I want is to be the first one or the last one kneeling, because as if the world really cares that much about that, but it's the way it is. Uh, and then the minute that last cup hits the plate, I launch into the blessing. 
and off you go. You know, the whole thing can feel like eating McDonald's in your car sometimes. Yeah, you know you've had a meal, but you sort of are like, that wasn't really that satisfying. There's got to be a way to build on the reverence that starts when we kneel. It might involve silence, which is a hard thing, right? Sometimes during the prayer when I say, and those we remember in our hearts. Do you ever wonder if I, my mind has wandered off and I'm going to forget to start again? I do, right? Silence is hard, but I think there is a way to be more intentional about communion, to give it the reverence that it deserves. I don't know what that way is, but we'll keep working on that. And finally, the theme of today's readings is really straightforward. Today's readings are about persistence. Jacob wrestles all night with the angel. Finally, the angel's like, this guy's not going to quit, so he dislocates his hip. Paul, Paul's uh, letter to Timothy, I hate to sum it up this simply, but it's, he's really telling him today, stick with it. Stick with it, buddy. And then in our gospel, this widow harangues a judge until he finds in her favor. So today's readings are all about persistence. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of the evangelist, and carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. Amen. 
Please stand as you're comfortable for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Christ. Please be seated. I kind of forgotten about this parable, the parable of the unjust judge, although I think it could be called something else, like the parable of the persistent widow or or something. The first part is really easy to follow, right? Especially for someone who has spent the last two days with a two-year-old and a four-year-old. What do they do when they don't get what they want? When I say no, they ask again. Maybe they try, at Sarah at the children's service, the kid said, that's when you use your manners is the second time, right? So you ask and then you say, please. Ask again, and you ask again, and you ask again, and it doesn't take that many. They don't ever get to five with me. I give up, right? I give in. Don't ask. Just ask me two, three times. You've got it. But this widow, it's a little bit different of a situation. This judge has all the power, and she has none. In a lot of translators, believe that the language that is used in this parable actually works better as a boxing analogy. So picture Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. She's all feisty, right? She wants what she wants. Bap, 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 bap. She's working the jab on this big bear of a judge, and he doesn't care. He can't hurt her. He doesn't care what God thinks. He doesn't care what anybody thinks. But she's persistent. Bap, 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 bap. And again, and again, and again. This isn't in private either. It's not in a judge's chambers. It's out in a courtyard. I just realized this morning that might be where that word comes from, courtyard. Could be, right? So they're out in public. And she's bap, bap, bapping away at him time and again and just working the jab. And he's just a big old clumsy bear. He's got one thing, right? Power. No. 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 And she keeps ducking it. And the way that it's phrased isn't that she's going to make him look bad. It's that she gives him a black eye. In all those fake boxing movies, what's the turning point? Somebody gets cut, right? Somebody gets, even in the, the few wrestling movies that there are, somebody gets cut, and then all of a sudden the invincible goes, ow, somebody hurt my face. Nobody makes me bleed my own blood. And then the good guy prevails, right? Well, he doesn't care what people think as long as they think He's mean. As long as they view him as, he doesn't care if they think he abuses his power, but they start to see this, and think about those movies again, right? What starts to happen? Everybody, all the money's on the judge. Nobody's got any money riding on Granny. She doesn't have a chance. And then all of a sudden, right? Rocky, Rocky, Granny, Granny. And he's like, oh, jeez, they like her better than they like me. I'm starting to look kind of stupid. She gave me a black eye, like literally and figuratively. Everybody's looking at me as a bully, that I'm hiding behind my power, not that I'm on top of my power, and we can't have that. I am important. 
So that part's really pretty straightforward. But then what about this comparison with God? Does God really work that way? Do we have to keep shooting the jab out at God to change God's mind? Think about how foolish that sounds. We're going to change God's mind. I know better than you, God. Just watch. I'll keep asking. Well, of course not. Yet we are called to be persistent in prayer. And now I can ask the same question of myself as I ask those little kids. What do I do when God doesn't answer my prayers? Or at least when God doesn't answer my prayers the way that I want my prayers answered. Right? There's a saying on that, like, uh, God always answers prayers, but he just doesn't always give the answer that we want or the answer that we're looking for. But if we're still focused over here, are we going to hear that answer? Are we going to see that answer? No. So this persistence in prayer results, should result in an increased sensitivity to what's going on, to what's really happening. It's a way to deepen our relationship with God, to start to figure out how God really works. Because God's not Santa Claus, right? God's not a genie. We don't say, God, I want this, and we get it. That's not the way it works. And sometimes, if we think about our prayers, a, a good example, I think, is when someone close to us is near the end of life. And we pray over and over again, please make them well, please restore them, please make them well. And then there comes a point where that prayer just doesn't seem like the right prayer anymore. They're in a point where really the right prayer seems to be give them comfort. Just keep them comfortable. Don't keep them alive for my sake, essentially. So then what do we do? Do we say, well, I prayed that they would get well, and they did, and I guess God's got nothing to offer. Someone from outside of Christianity would definitely do that. You prayed and prayed and prayed, and they still died, huh? Shows what good your God is. But there again, we've got that need for attentiveness. So when our prayers change, how else do they change? We start to ask ourselves, what is it that's really needed? And maybe we start to pray for healing for ourselves and for direction. How am I going to go on? Give me the strength to support this person at the end of their life and give me the strength to go on without them. And even more than that, we see so much ugliness at the time of death. Not for the person who's dying. We know where the person who's dying is going, but among siblings. Right? Fight. We misdirect our sadness and our anger, and we start to fight with each other, usually over pretty ridiculous things. And I, I will have multiple people as a pastor, multiple people from the same family who are all fighting with each other, tell me, we just want what mom would want. How can all three, four, five of you want what mom would want and none of you want the same thing? Was mom a big fan of cage matches? Did she lock you in the backyard in the fence and say, only one of you is coming over that fence and that's the one I love best? Because that's what you're doing. Over and over and over again we see families broken apart because they lose their way. And that's where that prayer comes in. Help me to be the person who takes the first step to stop this foolishness. Help me to listen to my siblings, to whoever, to feel their pain, to understand that they're not, well, they might be jerks, but they're not only jerks, right? They have some redeeming qualities too. Help us to really do what mom wants and more importantly, what God wants. That comes through attentiveness to our prayers. And that's why we're called upon to pray persistently. Amen.
also the children, please. Kids, you can, when you get up here, you can either sit in the front view or you can sit on the floor, wherever you can get a good view. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in the one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and joined in God's mission for the life of the world. So the first question is for the sponsors. Who presents Charlotte Lane Polinski for baptism? Riley and Lindsay, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Charlotte baptized? As you bring Charlotte to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, and to nurture her in faith and prayer, so that Charlotte may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world, world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Charlotte grow in the Christian faith and life? Do you? Do you? You do? Good. Good, good, good. Brianna, Mason, Tori, Brennan, and Brady, do you promise to nurture Charlotte Lane in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? People of Christ, do you promise to support Charlotte Lane and pray for her in her new life in Christ? Yeah. Congregation, please stand as you're comfortable. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce Do you believe in God the Father? I and believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, 
And through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. In the river Jordan your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The assembly may be seated. Kids, if you want to come up here by the water, what I would like you to do is put your finger in the water. It's a little chilly, but it's okay. Put your finger in there. Go ahead. Because we know what this is not, not fancy water, right? This is just water from the sink in the basement. But it's the words we say and it's the presence of God. So we take it and go like this down and like this across. Make a cross on your forehead. You don't have to, but that's what a pastor, for quite a few of you, it was me. That's what a pastor did to you. And it's when I do that, I say, you've been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. <clears throat> that cross never moves. All right. You kids can sit down and we'll go ahead and do the baptism. I'm going to bring Charlotte over here. Charlotte Lane Polinski, at the risk of waking you up, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm not going to break that picture, and I'm not going to break that picture. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Charlotte Lane with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, and the knowledge that she is well-loved, now and forever. Amen. Charlotte Lane, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Let us welcome Charlotte Lane. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Give a little round of applause here. So, the ladies of the church, and might not have been all ladies, everyone was invited, but I'm guessing you know someone who had a hand in making this quilt, right? So whenever you wrap Charlotte in this quilt, you're wrapping her in the love of those people in all of us here at Baxter. So if you would all like to be seated, Charlotte and I are going to take a little walk. Okay?
this time, we will have the kids and the noisy offering and the ushers come forward to collect the offering. So we get these dished out. Please stand as you're comfortable for the offer for you. Let us pray. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we bring our gifts to you, O God. Help us to give with them a ready mind, a willing spirit, and a joyful heart. Amen. Let us pray. People of God, as we come to prayer, let us remember that we do not have to twist the arm of a reluctant God to seek good things for this world nor find ways to persuade a distant God to come near and listen to us. Hear us, O oh God. Let us remember that as we pray, we kneel alongside Jesus Christ in the presence of God with the help of the Spirit. Hear us, O oh God. So let us bring to mind now these people, those people who are in need of our prayer. Those who are ill or anxious, those who are lonely or sad, those who are despairing or defeated, those who are hungry or homeless, those who, whose relationships are breaking apart, those who are bullied or abused, those who cannot find work, and those who are overworked. In silence now, let us make our own specific prayers for those on our hearts and minds today. Hear us, O oh God. In the presence of God, alongside Jesus Christ, with help from the Spirit, may we go into this week to live out our prayers through our lives. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples as he had so many times before. This time he said to them, This is my body, broken and given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup. And he offered it to God and he gave thanks. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Shed not only for you, but for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The table is ready. And we will start with the baptismal party. As many of you want to come around, I'd like to have the whole group come up, even if we have to do a double circle here. I think that's kind of cool. So if we can have everybody in this front section here first, that would be fantastic. And if you don't want to take communion, just don't put out your hand. So come on up, please.
Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Sending him is number 790. 